are the seven star messengers, messengers in every age. Before the star messengers become messengers, there are seven spirits before the throne of God. Okay? That's chapter 1, verse 4. So, the seven spirits before the throne of God, they represent a mystery which will be answered in chapter 8. Chapter 8, they are seven angels. The seven angels are not portrayed here. Maybe we can use this. The seven angels before the throne of God are the seven spirits before the throne of God. It was not yet identified as seven angels until chapter 8 when the seventh seal was opened. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's continue from the church age. So that's chapter 1. What is chapter 2? So chapter 1 is an introduction of Christ's love letter to the church. It's an instruction to John and some description of Christ being a mediator among the seven churches in Asia, represented by the seven candlesticks. Represented by the seven candlesticks. When Christ is walking among the midst of the candlesticks, he's mediating. He's the high priest. That's the introduction in chapter 1. In chapter 2, uh, Christ instructed John to write down all the uh, narrative in the seven churches in Asia. There are several applications for that, but one main application are the church ages. That's from chapter 2 to chapter 3. Those are the seven churches in Asia. Represent, uh, one representation is the seven church ages. Is it possible that among those scriptures there, they talk about the tribulation period? The hour of great trial that is to come upon the world? Yes. So, there's also a promise there about ruling in the millennium. But, the context of the promise was written for during the time of John and in the first century A.D., and uh, and the application are for the believers down through the ages that have slept in Christ, waiting for His coming. Now, chapter 4. What does chapter 4 talk about? I mentioned that a while ago. It was John uh, having a preview of heaven. So, let me, let me just use this illustration. It looks like the rapture, but... Uh, John was taken up to heaven. He had a preview of the heavenly throne room. So let me temporarily use this illustration for the heavenly throne room. The heavenly throne room that John saw culminated all to the Jesus Christ sitting in the throne of God. Now, uh, in the explanation of Brother Branham, Revelation chapter 5, different from the explanation of Brother Jackson, is it is the Father who is sitting on the throne room. Then there was what we call a lamb that came near. The lamb with uh, seven horns, seven eyes. And there was a book at the right hand of him. Uh, the book in the right hand sealed with seven seals. That's the, that's the introduction in chapter 5. So chapter 5 introduces the book with, sealed with seven seals. If no one could open, no one will be saved. And John cried about it. That's chapter 5. And the lamb, no one was worthy to open the book except the lamb that was slain. Seven horns, seven eyes represents the seven spirits of God represents the seven angels the seven angels the seven spirits that anointed the seven star messengers the lamb that has seven eyes seven horns seven um it came to take the book and he was worthy to un to unseal the book in brother jackson's explanation this is jesus christ as judge this is jesus christ as the lamb 
in my in my previous uh, explanation uh, the qualification of Jesus Christ to open the seals was not being a judge but as a lamb in the explanation of brother Branham and brother Gan brother Howard this is God the Father sitting in the throne this is Jesus Christ uh, that was worthy to open the seals both explanations are correct although the oneness would favor brother jackson's explanation the oneness uh, also will explain the, uh, that the father is jesus christ himself and the son of god the lamb of god and everything is the same god well brother jackson's explanation could be understood correctly in a sense that brother jackson's uh, explanation Brother Jackson's explanation could be understood that God, Jesus, this is this this vision in the throne room. This is not an exact because there's no literal lamb with seven eyes, seven horns. It is just an illustration to John, the ministry of Christ. Of course, God has no body, except for temporary theophanies in the past. The permanent body of God is Jesus Christ. So, we can imagine there's no literal lamb. It was just Jesus Christ as judge and as lamb. And him being the lamb gives him the qualification to open the seals. So, that's the correct understanding. It doesn't mean Jesus Christ is the Father. It, it could simply be understood Jesus, God the Father was in Jesus Christ. Because God the Father has no body. He used the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why you see only one sitting on the throne. That's chapter 4. So, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, as judge and as lamb, that it could be understood correctly from the explanation of Brother Jackson, not necessarily the extremism of the oneness. And But the explanation of Brother Branham and Brother Gann and Brother Howard is very simplistic. Jesus Christ is, sorry, the one sitting on the throne is God the Father. The, one, the lamb is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's very simplistic and it's also correct. They're both correct. You have to understand the right balance revelation of that. That's chapter 5. And the, in chapter 5 introduces the four living creatures. The lion, the calf, the face of the man, and the flying eagle. So the introduction of these four living creatures would be also the introduction to the four horses. The four horses is here. That's in chapter 6. Um, remember, everything in the book of Revelation, majority of them was already written in the Old Testament. It was just culminated in the New Testament through the book of Revelation. There is the white horse. That's chapter 6. The black, uh, sorry, the, the red horse. The white horse is here. Not very much clear. It looks white. So this is the red horse. This is the black horse. This is the pale horse. So, that's chapter 6. And chapter 6 includes those that were martyred by the Jews that were killed. The Jews that were killed, 6 million Jews killed by Hitler. And the, the rest of their brethren will be in the tribulation period. In the tribulation period, there would be martyred Jews, and that will be brother um, the hundred forty-four thousand. Brother Bergan doesn't explain it that way, but uh, they coincide with the foolish that have become wise. Their letter F there. So um, here in the martyred Jews, these are the fifth seal. The seventh seal. talks about uh, later that's in chapter 8 the seventh seal but it goes up to the sixth seal the sixth seal actually is the dreadful day of the lord this is the sixth seal seal six armageddon the dreadful day of the lord so with regards to chapter six that's where it ends Next is chapter 7. 
Chapter 7. I don't have an illustration for that. Chapter 7, there's a throne room. Maybe I'm going to use this. Wherein um, there are... It shows the ceiling of the 144,000. Where's the 144,000? It's written here. The 144,000 uh, sealed um, by the two prophets. It, uh, chapter 7 did not yet mention the two prophets. It mentions an angel having the seal of God. But it coincides, chapter 7 coincides with chapter 11 when the two prophet ministry starts. Chapter 7 talks about those that will be redeemed in the Great Tribulation. If we have parallel understanding with the church ages, those that will be redeemed in the Tribulation that came out of Great Tribulation, Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, verse 14. Um, where was I? Okay, so after chapter, uh, chapter 7 talks about those that will be redeemed in the Tribulation, and there's a parallel application. Brother Jackson applied it here. Uh, the foolish virgins in the church ages. So now, uh, let me remind that uh, other churches do not believe there is still one week left. The last week, week, uh, last week of Daniel. They believe the Daniel 70 weeks has run its course. It's finished in the time of Stephen. So, for them, it's only... The tribulation, the church ages are just the same. They are for the Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and maybe others. Those who do not believe that there is still one week left. So, for them, there is no parallel application. There is only one application here. But for us, the book of Revelation has parallel applications. Remember, this is seven years. This is seven church ages. The seven church ages coincide with the dream of Pharaoh that was interpreted by Joseph. Seven years of plenty and seven years of drought, of famine. It portends the church ages interconnected with the seven-year tribulation. The seven-year tribulation combines all the calamities that took place in the last 2,000 years. Let's continue to chapter 8. Chapter 8 Verse 1 speaks of the opening of the seventh seal. Majority of uh, end time explains the seventh seal as the rapture of the New Testament saints, the bride saints, until they go up to heaven, have the wedding, marriage supper of the Lamb. But if you read chapter 8, if you read chapter 8, chapter 8 um, chapter 8 of the book of Revelation begins with the introduction of the seven angels now there's no illustration of the seven angels but look at the seven uh, fire here in this illustration these are the seven angels and the same seven angels that anointed, anointed the seven star messengers are the same seven angels that will blow the seven trumpets. Chapter 8 begins with the seven trumpets. Until chapter 9. Until chapter 10. Chapter 10 had something to do with the coming of Christ. The Look at this illustration. Uh, the mighty angel coming down from heaven. Having... A book open in his hand. For others, it's the time of the ministry of Barbaram. For to Bar Frank, it is Christ coming down here on earth. But they're both correct because Christ came down as the Holy Spirit. Christ came down as the Word, the revelation of the Word until it culminates Barbaram. And Christ came down physically. Christ will come down physically in Armageddon down here on earth while World War III is taking place. So the trumpet ends 
chapter so starts from chapter 8 then ends in chapter 11 verse 15 when he announces to the world that uh, the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of, of our Lord God and of his Christ this is uh, the the announcement of the kingdom in the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet. That's where Revelation 10, 7 comes in. Uh, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the sound is this trumpet. He, uh, the, the mystery of God will be finished because Christ will come back down here on earth. There will be no more mystery. Before Christ comes back, there was still a mystery in the tribulation. There's the mystery of God here in the church ages. So that's chapter 10 and chapter 11. Chapter 11 also talks about the two prophets and how they would be killed and the, the woes, the free woes. So uh, be, there's overlapping between chapter 11, chapter 10, the trumpet. There is a parallel event that is taking place. But of course, when John was writing, he has to uh, write uh, one after the other. So it's just for our understanding, certain chapters of the verses coincide together, simultaneously take place. The ministry of the two prophets coincides with the blowing of the trumpets, judgments. Just because it is first mentioned in chapter 8 and the two prophets is chapter 11. It doesn't mean the trumpet blew without the ministry of the two prophets. They coincide with each other. So that's what we call a flashback. A par uh, another term we can use for the interpretation of the book of Revelation is parallelism. You have to understand there are parallel events taking place at the same time. That is how you understand the book of Revelation. It would be much harder for Brother Jackson to connect it like a connecting jigsaw puzzle. Uh, if there's no parallelism. Parallelism is a much more clearer way to present it. In Bar Jackson's uh, written chronology, uh, like the pitfall of, brother, uh, of writing in John's book of Revelation is that you still have to write something in advance and later. But in here in the illustration, you can see it at the same time. So that's chapter 11. Chapter 12 speaks of the Revelation 12 woman. We do we have an illustration here? It talk, there's no illustration. It talks about Israel. Israel. Let's talk about Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 represents a woman running to the wilderness. We're not going to go into much detail on that. But the woman is a, has a parallel application between the church and Israel. Israel is the center point here in the tribulation period, although the whole world will be affected by it. This is the final application of Malachi chapter 4, starting from verse 4, not just verse 5. Remember Moses, the law of Moses, and I will send you Elijah. Okay. Before that, there is a premon, uh, precursor of this Moses Elijah for the ministry of the prophet. So, now, the, when the woman of Revelation 12 runs to the wilderness, in the time of the church ages, parallel is when they ran to the United States. Brother Jackson applied the wilderness as United States, but he said it, was, it would be Israel that will run to the United States uh, to escape the beast, the Antichrist. But, um, Brother uh, Jackson's application of the wilderness fits the escape from the, the persecution in Europe uh, during the founding of the New World, the last fourth watch of this uh, 2,000 years. There's this Protestant Reformation. There's this revival. And when uh, the Protestant Revel uh, Reformation was taking place, they escaped to America as a wilderness. When they escaped to America as a wilderness, the wilderness in America 
served as the the place where the woman fled in Revelation chapter 12. The, a parallel application in Israel. In Israel, when the Antichrist takes over the temple, the woman Israel will flee to the wilderness. As they flee to the wilderness, as they flee to the wilderness, that's the application of the woman fleeing the dragon. And the dragon um, a gushing, uh, will gush out water from its mouth to drown the woman. It represents persecution. Remember Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. The end thereof shall be with the flood. It coincides with the flood of Revelation chapter 12. Now let's go to Revelation 13. There's an illustration in the book, but I don't have the book. It talks about the United States. I'm going to illustrate it by hand here. Revelation 13. Let me get a better marker. Revelation 13. It speaks of two kinds of beasts. One beast coming out of the sea and another beast coming out of the earth. You need a map to understand this. But I'm going to go very fast. Revelation 13 introduces two kinds of beasts. The first beast is similar to this. This illustration here is in Revelation 17, but this beast is an illustration also of Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2. Now, uh, there's a difference between the beast of Revelation 13, 1 and 2 and Revelation 17. Because Revelation 17 beast, it's scarlet, crimson, red. Uh, drunken with the blood of the saints. This is one of the illustrations here. The woman drunken with the blood of the saints. But, in Revelation 13, there's no, was, there, was, were, there was no woman sitting on the beast. The first beast. The beast that came out of the sea. What is the sea? The sea is the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean Sea represents the Mediterranean world. The Mediterranean world represents the old world. Now he's going to introduce that the beast, the first beast, was wounded unto death. So there was a time it declined its power. The Protestant Revolution and the revolution of the kings against... Uh, you can read in chapter 17, they, they, they will hate the beast and kill... They will hate the woman. The beast will hate the woman. So there was a time, uh, there was a decline of this European beast. Now how do we know... If you know how to identify the European beast, then you will know who the beast that came out of the earth. The beast came out of the earth is another continent from another continent aside from Europe. So the sea is a beast from Europe. Which is the other continent? That's the continent of America. That's the second beast. So you remember in the illustration, when Christ came down, he set his light foot on the sea and on the land. It's a universal um, coverage. And here we have the two beasts in Revelation 13 being introduced. And from Revelation 13, it talks about you cannot buy or sell without the mark. When will that take place? Here. What is that mark? It is your testimony, not a microchip, not a vaccine. The mark is your testimony if the two prophets are terrorists or they are of God. As simple as that. Those who are neutral, they are ship nations. I do not understand a the thing. They're heavens. Now, chapter 14. What does chapter 14 talk about? The everlasting gospel. So remember, they're starting, these chapters we're reading, there are parallelisms already taking place. 
parallelisms in the past. It talks about the beast from the past and, and until it goes through the future. And the beast from the earth helping out the beast. The beast from America is helping out the beast from Europe to re regain its strength. In chapter 14, the 144,000 was already sealed. And that's what we call the everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? Uh, the everlasting gospel, chapter 14, Revelation 14. The everlasting gospel speaks of fearing God. It's not about the Godhead, it's fearing God. Any heaven could fear God. The, their, uh, Babylon is fallen. I don't have space to write. And the third is, do not receive its mark. If any man receive its mark or worship its image, you will be thrown into a punishment in the lake of fire. So, that's Revelation 14. And Revelation 14 parallels, the events parallels with also Revelation 13, the last part, no one can buy or sell. So this mark will save many heavens, many, they didn't introduce Jesus Christ here in the everlasting gospel. Although Seventh-day Adventists and even uh, followers of Brother Branham applies the everlasting gospel as Luther, Cal, uh, Wesley, and Branham applies it during the church ages. Can there be an everlasting gospel among the churches? Yes. I said there, is, there are parallel applications in every chapter of, of Revelation. But here in, in chapter 14, the ultimate application is in the tribulation period where the everlasting gospel will be preached. Is the everlasting gospel being preached in the first half of the last week of Daniel, the tribulation? Not yet. Because chapter 14 starts from here, where the, they, the 144,000 are already sealed. During the first half, the 144,000 is in the process of being sealed. Take three and a half years to understand the gospel or re receive Jesus Christ. Some may be first, some may be last. But the completion is in the middle of the week. After the two prophets have finished their mission, they will be killed. And the 144,000 will begin their ministry. That's the, their message in chapter 14 is the everlasting gospel. The foolish that would repent to become wise because being, for being left behind will just follow that message. They will testify unto death. Let's go to chapter 15. Chapter 15 talks about the harvest of the earth. It talks about the dreadful thing that will take place in Armageddon. And it's an introduction to the vials. The, the, sorry, let me use the word bowls of judgment. Um, here is the illustration of Brother Gun for vials. It's vials in the laboratory. But I prefer the, prefer the word bowls. Because bowls of judgment, um, the angels will pour out bowls where the incense was placed. So in, in the altar, there's just one bowl where the incense was placed. But here, where the altar of incense was placed, that's in chapter 8. It was just explained in chapter 8. But it will be poured out starting from chapter 16. Chapter 15 is an introduction to that. Um, introduction to that event. It also explains here in Armageddon the blood of those that will be killed in World War III will reach the horse's bridles. Chapter 17 talks about the scarlet colored beast. That's why if you don't understand parallelism, flash forward, flashback, then you can jumble up all these chapters and verses. It could not be understood. But if you can understand each chapter has a parallel application that uh, uh, events could go hand in hand at the same time, then you can understand chap chapter 7 then even goes back in the time of the Dark Ages. 
when the woman was blunt, drunk with the blood of the saints. It flashed back here and it will culminate there. Uh, the, uh, she will be given one hour of uh, power, one hour with the beast. Now, from here, from uh, the uh, from chapter 17, we go to chapter 18. I don't have an illustration, but it's the fall of Babylon. The fall of Babylon is an announcement here, sometime here. Babylon is fallen. The ultimate fall, of course, is the World War III. Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. I have an illustration of Babylon. It's a type of that. Great in economy. If their country is very rich and good and prosperous in economy, that's a description of Babylon. And it will fall. And everyone will cry about it. It's as though it's the end of the world. That's chapter 18. Chapter 19 talks about, first, the, the bride. Uh, the marriage of the Lamb, the first part of chapter 19. The second part talks about the coming of Christ. Christ coming down out from heaven and destroying the enemies of God, the rebellious nations. The East will go to the West, go to Israel, and they will have World War III. And Matthew 24 says, Unless those days shall be shortened, no flesh shall be saved. So Christ will intervene to make those they stop. And what will happen to, the, to them? It says in chapter 19, the kings of the earth will war with the Lamb. Will make war with the Lamb. So the kings of the earth will set aside their differences because they view Christ as an alien invasion. If you have ever watched the movie Independence Day, the bickering nation, the bickering nations of the nations in the, the movie Independence Day they set them aside. Arabs, Israel joining together to fight against aliens. Well, that movie will show, biblically, when Christ comes back down to here, they don't believe the Bible anymore. They don't even believe the gospel. They don't even believe God. So what they see is just alien invasion. And when Christ comes back down here on earth, he will appear as a great light. Uh, so every eye shall see him. This is also the part of the six seal, Armageddon. And this is also the part of the, the part of the six seal. And this is also the part of the um, Revelation 19. Let's go to Revelation 20. Revelation 20 talks about the millennium. And in, it also talks about the rebellion. That's 20 verses 1 to 6. Those who are part in the first resurrection. This is the last part of this resurrection. And here is the part of the rebellion in Revelation chapter 20 verse 7. The next few verses talks about the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20 verse 15. Revelation 21 also has parallel applications, starting from the millennium and also here in the eternal age. Revelation 21 speaks of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God. So this represents the final days, the end of the, the final uh, new heaven and new earth. The word new heaven, new earth from chapter 21 could be expressed. Uh, uh, um, prematurely applied to the millennium. But the millennium is a portending of the eternal age. The eternal age is no more rebellion, no more sin, no more sickness. And here, there's no, there's no more sin of men. And this is chapter 21. Chapter 21 can par be parallel to the millennium. Even chapter 22. Chapter 21 and 22 is between Millenn uh, sim parallel of the millennium in the eternal age. There's water that co will come out from Jerusalem and uh, God will be the God of them all. Jesus Christ is the temple. So that is the summary of the chronology of the book of Revelation. Uh, I, uh, those I added in the video can ask questions. Uh, is there any question? Brother Lito, Brother... Sister Len Len, uh, Lord, thank you for this uh, short moment of... Uh
Bible study, morning devotion. I pray that many things that could not be understood, they, you give them a hunger to ask questions and sharing the family. And uh, your servant uh, has, some lim has many limitations, but only you in your Holy Spirit can open up the eyes of your children regarding thy word in the last day. Why did you reveal all these things for us? For our protection, for us to be judge and rulers. So perfect your saints, anoint them, Lord. And um, I thank thee for this moment. All these things um, we, we, uh, we put under your feet in Jesus Christ's name.